Just a quick disclaimer for the video, I did have a setting in my recording software that was prematurely cutting out my voice during certain segments of the audio, so I do apologize in advance for that. Hello my friends, and welcome to the last installment of the Divide and Conquer version 5 faction overviews. We've covered every faction from A to W in the mod, starting with the Anduin Vale and finishing with the Redland Realm. Now, I am going to apologize in advance as my voice is a bit coarse right now. I've been dealing with a cold for the past few days, so this video is coming out a bit later than my original schedule. Um, but it is a three-day weekend for us here in the States, so this will be releasing on Labor Day or otherwise Monday. And of course, you guys will know that when you see the video pop up in your feeds. So a little bit about the Woodland Realm in a general sense. You are the best cavalry, not cavalry, you are the best archer nation in all of Middle Earth. You have pound for pound the most archers and the most accurate and in a general sense, the most damaging. I mean, there are a few exceptions to that role, such as like the Steel Bowman, the Dunedain having armor piercing, or the Temple uh, Wards that Mordor has. But in a general sense, your roster has the highest accuracy, the largest range, and the greatest missile damage, especially when you come to one of their units, Legolas's Bodyguard, the Hin E Dower, the Eyes of the Forest are the strongest archer unit in the entire mod bar none. So, going into your starting settlements, first of all, you do have Thranduil's Halls here, located near to the towns of Dale, Lake Town, and Erebor. Thranduil's Hall does have a unique building, the Woodland Caverns, which just gives you extra trade, public order bonus, two free upkeep slots, which is pretty nice, and it is your diplomat building. Thranduil's Halls is a unique settlement should you ever fight a battle here. It's basically like it is on the campaign map. There is one entrance over a bridge, and then the entire remainder of the city is actually like built into a hill it's all like in a cavern essentially so it's quite an interesting settlement all the enemy has to funnel through a gate and if you let them in you can just shoot them to death with your archers it is a massacre besides that you have a hall of song giving you your tier one meeting hall building you have a barracks for your standard recruitment along with the practice range so you can get your archers and your infantry right out of the gates does come with an inn so you can train spies here. You have land clearance, the tier 2 road, and the artist studio. As for your starting army in there, you have King Thranduil, your faction leader, who does have a unique biography here, giving him plenty of hit points. 8 there is the big thing. He is very unlikely to die, and his bodyguard is quite powerful. I'm not going to try to pronounce this ancillary, the Eren en Lekutare, I'm going to assume. That's how you pronounce that. Someone is going to comment down below that my pronunciation was awful of that and if you have the correct pronunciation please go ahead and put it down there i know i just said i wasn't going to and i still did so maybe that's a bit of my sick right now he also has the emeralds of gary and giving him a little bit of happiness and trade bonus as well he does have a special ability swiftness you'll find this is the same ability that legolas and your other unique general will have it's quite a decent ability fatigue reduction permanently regrazes your enemy's fatigue and gives you extra combat effectiveness. So do note it does only last about 20 seconds, so it doesn't last that long. It's a very short term ability. And Thranduil has a unique battle map model. There he is in his silver battle armor, and his bodyguard is the er the Ered Hirith, I think is how you pronounce it. And they have locked morale, and they are a very powerful unit there. I believe they even they have armor piercing missiles. I don't think they do. I think they have not they had armor piercing um melee, I could be wrong there. I think it's just a very high melee attack. Get more into the units in the later half of the video. You also have Woodland Spearmen and Woodland Scouts. For your other starting settlement, it is Orphelin to the west of Thranduil's Halls, and that is where Prince Legolas is found, also with a unique strategy map model there, taking after his actual appearance. Legolas does have a biography, of course, giving him lots of hit points, movement speed and other things command and such he is a very powerful general same special ability for him he does have the swiftness and he does have a few nice ancillaries which you can see there his bodyguard are the henny dower the strongest archers in the game they have the highest accuracy some of the highest range that's like artillery level range and they have a body piercing arrows so we'll show how devastating those are in the later half of the video the other starting forces that can be found at Torfilin are Woodland Scouts, the Mytheri Thewire, 
and the Woodland Spearmen. So you have a relatively small starting army, but you can recruit more from Thranduil's Halls. You can get four units right out of the gates here, and you get four from Torfilin. Torfilin also comes with the Hall of Song, the Barracks, the Practice Range, the Roads, and the Artist Studios. So your two starting settlements are basically equal in what they have to begin with. I think the only difference is the unique building in Thranduil's Halls and What's the other building here? Am I missing something? I think it's the... Is it the inn? I think it's the inn that you don't have here. So the inn and the unique building are the only separation between Thranduil's Halls and Thorfeelian. So you have two decently built up starting regions. Now you have one other character that you can unlock after 10 turns, and I believe his name is Orthordir, I believe. I think I have it here. Yeah, Orthordir. Here comes with the units of Elven King's Gate Guard. And he also has the special ability Swiftness that Legolas and Thranduil have. To unlock Orthodir, you simply need to have conquered four regions, so there's two right there. Um, you don't need to conquer four or more, you just need to have control of four, and turn ten has to have passed. So if you have these two regions, Arendolin and Imin Nufuin, or you take Witherboard or any other combination, and it is turn eleven or beyond, you will have a third general that you can use. And he is quite powerful, he's a dedicated infantry general which is quite powerful for your faction so that leads on to rebel expansion and i basically already went through it Aaron Dolan is the easier settlement to take to the south and the new does have a half a stack of i believe just orcs here orc fighters and there should be um some uruk bodyguards i believe the merc would work bodyguard variant so not too hard to actually defeat considering you have very powerful archers in legolas and king thrand will you can really just skirmish with these factions shoot run away shoot run away rinse and repeat you should have too many issues taking these first two settlements other expansion that is a bit more profitable is to go to the north to take with a board and then push on to dane's halls and rakyaburg so you do have the snow orcs here now do note you are not at war initially with the orcs of gundabad you are neutral your only starting enemy is dogal dur who are to the south and southeast of you they are relatively close considering at the turn to auto expansion they take erin runen and ver alge over here there is a bit of a gap they don't get Usture, they don't get Enethaur. but you will soon be fighting dogolder on the campaign map and most likely the orcs of gundabad will attack you as well now the orcs of gundabad are very powerful in the current iteration of divide and conquer they often are able, in my experiences, they often can make it and take Erebor. They often kill King Dane, they often sack Erebor, and they are just a menace. Oftentimes they'll do a lot of damage to Anduin Vale, taking Framsburg and possibly Mithailburg if the goblins don't get to that one first, and often I have seen them besiege and take Bjorn's Hall. So if you do not fight Gunabad, then they may become very, very powerful. Beyond that, to the south, other regions in your expansion path, Enethaur, Erdenruinen, potentially Bur Elge, if Dale doesn't reach you to it, Disturre, which used to be Brown Boat back in the day, Ostengael, Dorlingvar, and eventually Dorgaldur. Now, you are going to want to defeat Dorgaldur and take over M1 Lank and rebuild it over here. And I believe if you do, you can train either your General's Bodyguard for Thranduil, the Ered Heareth, if you decline the Elven Union script. Um, and that'll also give you Ents there as well. So I should talk about the Elven Union script. If it has passed 45 turns and you have been allied to the Galadrum Elves, it is basically the exact same as if you do it for Lorien. You will be given a messenger. If you let him in, he will then warn you of an incoming attack from Mordor. And if you pay 3,000 gold, you will get four units of Woodland Wardens to help you defend your cities. Those are the... I don't think we have a starting unit of them. They are the Javelin Elves. And then you defeat the oncoming army. It's really just a bodyguard, trolls, and then uh, a little more than half a stack of, like, just Orc Raiders and Orc Band. Just complete Orc Crash. Not a hard battle defeat unless you just leave nothing in Thranduil's Hulls to defend it with. If you then defeat that army, you will then be offered to join in union with the Elves of the Galadrum. And if you do, you will take over their lands, you will have their generals, their armies, and you can recruit a select few units from their faction. And if you decline, you can then instead train this very, very powerful unit. 
or sorry, powerful building, the Sylvan Gathering, which will give you Yavana's Garden. This will give you max recruitment slots, extra free upkeep, improved roads and trade, experience for archers, a global culture bonus, an amplification to your culture bonus, growth, a global free upkeep slot, and a global recruitment slot, while also giving you the ability to train the Ents. Now you can get up to three of these, one in Thranduil's Halls, the other in Karis Galaton, and the last one in Dorgolder. Now should you decline that and you instead join in the Union, then you will be able to train a select few units from the Lorien roster, so I'll go ahead and load a save that has that, and I can show the other General Orthodir. So here we are much later in the campaign, and in this one I have allied with the and well not allied with, but you know, allied with Lorien and done the Elven Union. So I have Karis Galadhan, I have their unique generals, and Premi over here, who was the Discord member who I believe it was his UI was chosen for I think it was the faction selection screen. Um, I think it was his icon stuff that were chosen. Uh, or it was the artwork competition. I can't remember quite which one. And I know Orthodir was also part of the artwork competition as well. So you do get Kelebor and Lorien Sentries Warders. Anything that Lorien had trained, you will just automatically have. So in this case, they have some scouts, some archers, and warders. Though do note you won't be able to retrain all of those units. So if I go to Thranduil's Halls here, I can go in the barracks line. Um, with the army barracks, the units you'll get are the Sentinels of Karen Amroth, the Galadrim Guards, and the Galadrim Swordsmen. And sorry, it, it's Galathrim. The H is pronounced like a TH. So apologies to everyone who may be cringing in the comments down below saying that my pronunciation is awful right now. <laughs> the Galathrim. And then the other unit you will get is in the stables. You get the Lurian Scouts, giving you just an okay light cavalry unit. So you get a small pattering of their units to supplement your roster with. And then somewhere in here, I do have an Orthodir. Show you him now. He just has a standard strategy map model. This is, I believe, for your regular generals or family members. He has the Elven King's Gate Guard and a unique biography there as well. That special ability, Swiftness, like I discussed earlier. So just general campaign strategy I could give for the Woodland Realm. Of course, try to take these two regions, expand down south, you do have a roster that is very favorable against fighting the Snow Orcs, but only at range, and that is because the Snow Orcs have very little armor in their early tiers, but once they get their, like, mid-tier barracks and their, like, tier 3 barracks, they have some very powerful armored infantry, but in the early game, the Snow Orc Scouts, the Snow Orc Spearmen, and the Snow Orc Warriors, or whatever they're called, Raiders, I think, they have very, very low armor, so you can simply shoot them to death, but if they get into melee, they are going to be pretty much on par, if not stronger, than your equivalent melee troops. Your wooden spearmen, I don't think they beat the Snorok spearmen in melee. They might they might actually beat them slightly, but it's going to be a brutal conflict. And the same goes for your standard woodland warriors. They just will not have a good time fighting the Snorks in melee, especially when it gets to their late game roster. So if you can... Try to push northwest to take Dane's Halls, which can make you a ton of money, and Rakyburg along with Withaboard. If you can just kind of neutralize the effectiveness of the Snorks earlier on, you're going to have a good time. If you don't, then their late game super heavy armored units are going to be quite the challenge to deal with, as you don't necessarily have armor piercing archers to a great extent. I mean, you have the body piercing ones, and you have very good archers, but when it comes to dealing with heavy armored Hail Urux, that is where things get a little more difficult for you. To the south against Dol Guldur, things are not so bad. Their units are much weaker than the Snow Orcs' variants. The main thing with Dol Guldur that you're going to struggle with is the fact that they just swarm with many, many bodies. So even though you have great archers, and the archers are going to get a lot of kills, in the grand scheme of things, there are just so many orcs to kill that you will probably have to go into melee at some point and then take some casualties there. Whereas the Snow Orcs in the early game have relatively smaller battalion sizes. But when you have to take care of like 251 Markwood Goblins per unit, like just four of those is a thousand bodies you have to kill. That is quite a few arrows that goes to killing those units and they have a lot of fodder that way. And then even the later game Markwood stuff, the Markwood Uruks and stuff, 
They aren't terribly resistant. They don't have the armor stats or durability of the late game storks, but still they do come in higher numbers than your units. So you will be shooting many arrows, but overall Durgledur is not that hard to deal with, especially with the power of Legolas and Grand Will. That's about it for the campaign map side of things. Once you do take out Durgledur and you take all this region, you pretty much only have to deal with either Rune or Mordor and then Gundabad if you have not finished them off by that point and things become very straightforward it's really just slaying works by the tens of thousands if you get into the super late game and have to go fight mortar at the black gate but you will have the archer infrastructure and decent frontline units in the elven kings gate guards and elven kings uh, axe guards that it's not too bad you can hold the line very well with your elite elven infantry and just decimate the orcs from afar with your range so I will now go ahead and take it over to the battle map. And here we are now with what I believe is the smallest roster in the entire mod, especially for the Elven Nations. Maybe the High Elves are around the same, but I think the Wooden Realm actually has the smallest roster in the mod. Now, there is one other thing that I remembered that I wanted to get out of the way, and that is that you can recruit Avari Spearmen as a mercenary unit if you ever reach Rovanian region. So... If you do go down there, you can recruit some Elven Mercenaries and you can get some extra Dark Elven influence there. So with that out of the way, we'll go into the standard roster, starting with, I guess we'll go with the Archers first. It makes the most sense. The General is over here. The so first of all, your General's a Bodyguard. The, I believe, you know, do I even want to try to pronounce this? Is there a guide in here? Okay. Tawar Arrhenior, I guess? Arrhenior? Uh, you guys, you guys will know better how to pronounce that than me. I'm going to say Tawar Arrhenier, but that is probably not even correct. They have 11 melee attack and 11 missile attack with 215 meter range, 32 missiles, and a locked morale with a good movement speed bonus of 110%. Do you note they don't have a shield or anything, they just have a one-handed sword when they do go into melee. They are much better used at their range, and they do have a very high defense. That 14 armor means that they can take incoming archer fire without actually suffering too many casualties on their own end. It's probably best to use them in a loose formation in that scenario just so that they can observe the archer's fire while your other units can go ahead and skirmish basically without having to worry about counter fire as they do have a high missile attack. And the way the battle AI likes to go about things is they like to prioritize shooting at units that have the highest missile attack on your side. So often that'll be like your javelins or your axe throwers for other nations or any other type of skirmisher like that. But for the Woodland Realm, it's probably going to be this unit right here. If not them, then one of your other heavily armored archers, they will receive the fury of the enemy goblins and their arrows. Which is quite nice, because this one small unit can basically be a distraction while the rest of your archers can stay alive. And this one will regenerate at the end of the battle. But do note, at only 38 elves per battalion, it isn't likely that this unit will get a whole lot of killing done. Even though they do have a good amount of missiles at 32, that is only 32 multiplied by their 38 soldiers. So like a little over a thousand arrows or something like that total if they get all their shots off. Compared to someone like the Woodland Scouts of 20, but they have 139 soldiers. They're getting off like 2,500 arrows instead. So that is one downside to this unit, but they are incredibly useful just for the sheer uh, fact that they have that very high armor stat. So going into your next archers, the Watch Woodland Scouts. You guys have 5 melee attack, 6 missile with a 4 charge bonus and 8 defense. So only 4 armor and 4 defensive skill. They do have a 120% movement speed though, so they are best used firing and running and just continue doing that. You want to skirmish with these guys, avoid melee, and only stick them in melee if you absolutely have to. Or maybe you want to do a rear charge to help route an enemy unit that's the only case i'd really throw these guys into melee unless you really have no other choice but given their movement speed modifier you should be able to pretty much endlessly run away from any other unit so long as it isn't cavalry and then shoot and then run aka the shoot, and shoot method. Now, it does say their accuracy is low but for elves that is still a really good accuracy elven Accuracy descriptions are better, like, so, like, average for an elf is better than average for a human or dwarf, and average for the human or dwarf is better than average accuracy for an orc unit. That's kind of how it works here. So even though it says it's low, I'd say put them around maybe, like, a human's average or maybe a human high. They are still quite accurate, though only 20 missiles per each, but they will be your bread and butter 
in the early stages of the campaign. Recruit plenty of these guys and they'll do you very, very well, especially because every time you kill someone with an arrow, that is one less elf that has to die in melee combat. <laughs> Next to them, I place the Woodland Wardens, and arguably these guys are perhaps more infantry than they are in the range category, but they do have javelins, so I bundled them in here. Significantly better in melee than the scouts at 7 melee attack. They have an 8 missile and 7 charge bonus with 13 defense. A little bit slower at only 114% movement speed. Low accuracy again, but like I said, for the scouts, that's still pretty good. And 3 javelins each with 65 meter range. They are skilled against mounts, but only with their thrown projectile. When they go into melee, these guys will switch to a one-handed sword. But that shield does allow them to resist enemy archer fire decently okay with that higher armor bonus of 5. But going into the second tier when you've built the upgraded practice range. First of all, the Woodland Sentinels. These are the direct upgrade to the Woodland Scouts. Going up to 8 melee attack and 8 missile attack. So significantly better there. A little more charge at 5 and 14 defense. They have quite the armor upgrade here going from 4 to 8. And a little more defensive skill going from 4 to 6. They have very good morale and good morale response. That same movement speed modifier. So again, with these guys, you should never let them go into melee as long as they have ammunition, unless there really is no other choice. And that's like maybe cavalry chasing them and, and got them out in a bad position. But try not to let that happen. If the enemy has cavalry and I'm playing the Woodland Realm, I try to focus fire those things down. Like if they have wargs, I'll shoot the wargs down, get rid of them. And then my archers are safe to just shoot and shoot and scoot for the rest of the battle. They immediately jump to high accuracy, so there's a significant accuracy jump. They're going to get way more kills than the Woodland Scouts are, and they are a much more valuable unit. So they will have a higher upkeep. It's either four, I think it's 420 to 450 upkeep per turn for the Woodland Sentinels, while the Woodland Scouts have an upkeep of about 320. So it's not a huge upkeep increase for a significantly stronger unit. So I highly recommend getting Woodland Sentinels over Woodland Scouts if you are, like once you have that battlefield capacity and you have the infrastructure, get the Sentinels as often as possible. They will replace the Scouts as your bread and butter archer unit. Next to them are the upgraded variant of the Woodland Wardens. These are the Elder Council. Now the Elder Council, a few less elves in the battalion as is typical for going into the higher tiers. They have 102 with 11 melee and 11 missile attack. And their missile attack is armor piercing for these guys. It is not for the Woodland Wardens. So their javelins are quite powerful. They also have a spear in melee. So after they have thrown their javelins, they are good against cavalry and other mounts. So they make for an excellent front line unit. Especially if you are worried about cavalry or otherwise, putting them on the flanks where the cavalry likes to run to. That can defend your archers and do lots of damage. Any cavalry that tries to charge them head on is going to be met with a volley of spears uh, from range. And then they're going to run into the pointy sticks in melee and they're just not going to have a good time. Now, do not just say low accuracy there for the Elder Council, but they are javelins so that even though it is low accuracy, they do have pretty close range projectiles. So they aren't going to miss too many of those throwing spears. They also have very good morale and good morale response tied there with the Woodland Sentinels. So it's a great upgrade to have. You know, they share your uh, missile attack stat with your other Elven units, so they will likely draw arrow fire towards them. But they do have a higher shield value at 5 plus that 9 armor. That is 14 armor, pretty much 14 defense against any missile units. That makes them quite formidable. But do note that everything in the Woodland realm roster does have typically low numbers of models in them except for the archers you'll see the archers actually have more than the other variants in their roster so just kind of hitting home that the archers are meant to be the main part of your army versus like infantry like 102 for the elder council or 127 for the woodland sentinels you don't really see that for other elven nations they're usually tied at these tiers now, the next archer unit, your tier 3 here, is going to be your Elven King's Bogar. These guys are great. They should have locked morale, yet they can't be broken. Slightly less movement speed than 110%, and that is just because of their armor stat. They are now at 13 armor with 6 defense. Very high accuracy and 220 meter range. That is huge. That's basically ranger level um, range and ranger level accuracy. In fact, even better because they are elves, so they're very high. is like the equivalent of the exceptional accuracy stat. That, like some human rangers might have 32 missiles they are going to be firing for a very long time at 10 missile attack these guys are going to get plenty of high precision 
high arrow damage kills throughout the battlefield, and even in melee they are not bad either. They have one-handed swords, but that 11 melee attack makes them very formidable um, when it comes down to getting down and dirty with the enemy, especially those orcs. They're not gonna, they're not gonna beat the Elven King's Bogart in melee any time of the week. So our last few archer units here are the Hini Dower and the Arid Hereth. The Hini Dower, 76 per battalion, 11. Melee attack, 12 missile attack, that is the highest in your roster. 5 charge and 14 defense. They're not crazy high defense, they're a little more glass cannon, but they have exceptional accuracy. 240 meter range and only 16 arrows, but these are silver thorn arrows. I think there's a, I thought there was a mention of it somewhere in the description, but it appears to no longer be here. I thought they had their own little um, mention somewhere. But these elves have a body piercing arrows, so while they are great at that range, they're even more deadlier at close range when they can fire basically 90 degrees straight into an enemy battalion. And just, especially if you can sideswipe them, get them on the flanks, you can shoot down a battle line. These guys, more often than not, you'll get a thousand kills or more per battle per unit of Hini Dower that you field. Especially on a bridge battle, if you ever get the luxury of defending a bridge with Hini Dower on your side. You are going to do amazing. These guys are going to just create a bloodbath on that bridge. And they'll come out of a battle easily two to 3,000 kills. It is not rare for these guys to pretty much solo armies on bridge settlements. And even in cities and other battle maps where there are tight choke points, the Hinning Dower absolutely excel. Though do just note that their lower armor stat does make them susceptible. So if you do want to play the game of getting them to close range to dish out more damage, they are more likely to get counterfired. So there's a little bit of strategy to them. Do you want to keep them far away and safe, but get less damage output on them because of the firing arc? Or do you want to get them pretty much just straight in with the enemy and they function like an armor-piercing gunpowder unit where the arrow just fires straight through like a dozen men at a time? They are incredibly powerful and arguably somewhat broken in the mod, but they are so fun to use. They, if you haven't played a Woodland Realm campaign, Try them out, send Legolas into battle, and just watch as these guys annihilate the enemy for you. The last archer unit and your uber tier variants pretty much on par with the Hini Dower, though they're not going to do that same crazy damage output. The Arid Heareth, 15 melee attack, that is armor piercing, 11 missile attack, in charge with 26 defense, locked morale, very high accuracy with 32 missiles. This is Thranduil's bodyguard, and you can only recruit more of these guys if you reject the Elven Alliance. And of course, if you do reject it, you will get these guys in Amon Lack, Harris Galadhan, or in Thranduil's Halls. And of course, you get the ability to train the Ents from those locations uh, as well. So they are very powerful. I personally like to lean towards doing the Union. I like to have the four extra Lorien units that I think help pad out the Woodland Realm roster a bit more, especially in the infantry department. But the Arid Hereth are still incredibly, incredibly powerful, and it's nice to have more of these guys You'll see that when you have Thranduil on the battlefield, you are unlikely to lose. He is just an absolute monster in melee combat and at range with these guys. They do have these cool two-handed axes that they switch to once they go into melee. That is it for your archers there. Now we'll talk about the infantry next. So your tier 1 are going to be the Woodland Spears. 114 elves per battalion, so pretty low number there at your starter level spears. They do have shield wall, which is nice. 7 attack, 6 charge, and 15 defense. Uh, they do know, as I was trying to say about Gundabad earlier, the Gundabad Snow Orc Spears are going to have around 160 Orcs per Battalion, while your Woodland Spearmen have about 114. And I believe the stats are more or less... They're about the same. I think the Woodland Spearmen are slightly better, but you're going to be so outnumbered that they pretty much trade one for one on the battlefield, and you can't really afford those losses as the elves since your replenishment and recruitment is much slower than the other nations. They're adept at hiding in woods, so you can do some sneaky strategies with these guys. Maybe try to spread them out in the forest, maybe try to get some flanks, or just position them somewhere where you think cavalry might go, then they'll spring out, cavalry won't get their charge, and they'll just run into braced spears, in which case the spears will make short work of any wargs or other cavalry that tries to engage with them. Good morale and good morale response, but they may flee if they start getting a lot of Spear debuffs such as Poison Archers or the Nazgul Screech, it will make the Woodland Spearmen run away. And sorry there, I had to close my window. I think there was someone using power tools or something outside and I worried it was getting on the microphone here. 
So the other unit are the Woodland Warriors. These are much better in melee, at least in infantry, than the Woodland Spearmen. Nine attack makes them quite aggressive, plus that six charge bonus. They are pretty solid at doing flanking maneuvers, especially considering they can hide in woods very well. Um, they make for a great infantry hammer to your Woodland Spearmen's anvil. So don't expect them to do too much against more heavily armored orc units. They can do okay, though, against things like Dol Guldur Host. They'll pretty much trade one for one with Snow Orc Raiders, which isn't a trade that you want to take, but if you absolutely have to, they are pretty much your only early game tool for that. They'll try to shoot those units down from range. I swear at one point I thought they had armor piercing maybe in a much earlier version of the mod, which was kind of cool, but that was either taken out or I'm just having the Mandela effect, and they never did have armor piercing. I could have sworn they did. There was a time when a lot of one-handed axe units did have AP, but the Woodland Warriors do not, so... Other than that, they are just okay in melee, but they will die relatively quickly. And their low battalion size does mean that once you start taking casualties, you really feel it with these units. Our mid-tier infantry unit are the My Theory the Wire. These guys have 102 per battalion, so very small battalion, but they fill a nice role in your roster, being that they are armor-piercing strike infantry, and you will have to fight some amount of armor as you play as the Woodland Realm, especially from Gundabad and some of the, like, say, the Castellans of Dogoldur. These guys are great counters for, and if you ever fight the Dwarves of Erebor, well, you're gonna want a lot of these guys in the battlefield. 11 attack, 9 charge bonus, plus that armor piercing, 114% movement speed modifier. They are very swift on the battlefield. They can dish out tons of damage on the charge, and they're no slouches when it comes to their defense skill, considering they have 17 total defense, 9 armor, and 8 defense skill. They are great in melee. Now, they're not going to beat, say, Axe Guard of Erebor, but they are going to beat things like Mirkwood Bodyguards. I think they... I don't, I don't know if they would beat Pale Orcs in a straight fight, but they would do well if they could flank those units. They're going to do great against things like Mirkwood Uruks, Mirkwood Uruk Spearmen. Um, flanking onto a unit of Castellans will do a lot of damage. So they are a very, very useful unit in your roster, especially before you get things like the Hinny Dower. They are some of your best early game, early to mid game armor piercing units, but they are not your only melee armor piercing units. I mean, of course there is the Aired Hearth, but there is another and we'll get into them right now. And that is the Elven King's Axe Guard. One of the few axe handed units that still has armor piercing in their profile. They have 10 attack, eight charge, AP melee with 26 defense and locked morale. All of the Elven King's units do come with locked morale, but do you know the very small battalion size at only 89? That is pretty much like Mithlon Nobles or Smiths of Regian level in terms of unit size, but without the stats to match those. So you do, as the Woodland Realm, have less melee units per battalion than the other Elven nations, but you do get to more archers, so that kind of bounces it out. But the Elven King's Axe Guards are certainly a treat in your roster. AP solid melee stats, and that good charge bonus plus their movement speed means they can work as a great hammer and anvil unit. They also come with shield walls, so if you need to use them in a more defensive position against cavalry, or if you need to use shield wall to push into enemy formations, they are going to be great at that. And I, for one, have always just been a big fan of the visuals of these guys. I absolutely love them. It is just a shame that they are such limited by their low battalion size, but they have the melee stats to really stick to anyone that they have to go up against. And the other unit, a unit I really, really love as well, because they use these two-handed, like, full-arm weapons, these, like, two-handed glaives. I love it. The Elven King's Gate Guard, basically the anti-cavalry variant of the Axe Guard. A bit less defense, but significantly higher attack at 17. So even against infantry, these guys are going to do really well at their true blenders in combat. 10 charge, 17 attack, 21 defense, hiding at wood, skilled against mounts, and locked morale. Especially against mounts, these guys will absolutely annihilate, like, Kamul Shadow Knights, Orgs, any other cavalry that you may have to go up against. You're going to want to have some Gate Guard defending your flanks, or just charging into the cavalry. They will do tons and tons of damage, and like I said, like how I said, the Runic Dragon Guard are some of my favorite units. The Gate Guard just take those guys to a whole nother level, a whole nother level with that incredibly, incredibly high attack. That 17 is massive. So they are a bit squishier as a result of them not having the shield that the Axe Guard have. And then we get into our final infantry unit, though really it's more of a monstrous unit. 
and that are the Ants. And I talked about them in the Lorien video, I think. Ants, you just require M1 Lank or the... Well, you need to reject the Elven Alliance to get them in, in Dolgaldur slash M1 Lank. Or you can get them in Thranduil's Halls or Karen Amroth if you reject the Alliance. Or you can also get them in Isengard. If you take over Isengard, you'll be able to train these. And I did that in my Wooden Realm campaign, which, like many of my campaigns, I have an unceremonious final episode where I don't really have a final episode. I just kind of stopped the series at one point. So that's a bad habit of mine. But you can get these guys if you do end up taking Isengard. Ants have 45 attack, they're good against mounts, they frighten nearby enemy infantry. 7 hit points with 41 defense, it is very, very hard to kill these guys. And though it says their movement speed is 70%, they're actually going to be significantly faster than anything else on your roster, just due to their sheer model size. The Ents are very fast, and they are definitely best suited to fighting cavalry and elite units like that. And will Shadow Knights absolutely fear the Ents in melee combat. They'll also do great against trolls. They'll stop troll charges in their tracks and they'll beat them one on one. I think even the Olog High, I believe the Ents are stronger than Mordor's Olog High. Though I can't quite recall. Maybe the Olog High have similar stats, but I think Ents do win that fight. Ents very, very powerful, though very limited in availability. And they also have a, an upkeep cost of 800 gold per turn. So they're very expensive to field, but they are very much worth it. So going into our. our Cavalry units, and for those, you have two, both being horse archers in a loose formation, so you don't have good charging cavalry. In fact, yeah, you really don't have good charging cavalry. Well, these guys do have okay charging stats. That loose formation does kind of mitigate how much damage they really can do. Your first tier, you have the woodland horse archers at seven melee attack, six missile, and three charge with eight defense. Both these units do have the Cantabrian Circle, high accuracy, 140 meter range, and 30 missiles. They're okay. They're going to be best used skirmishing against enemy war riders and then chasing the enemy after they start to rout. But you don't really want to send them into dedicated melee, especially keep them away from spears. They are absolute glass cannons in melee, but they are some of your best tools for running down routing enemies quickly. While your infantry is more than capable of running down enemy routing infantry, the cavalry will do it faster than your infantry can. And the last unit, the Aethericon. These guys are significantly better at 8 melee, 8 missile attack, and 5 charge bonus with 14 defense. Very good morale, high accuracy, 150 meter range, 34 missiles, and they also inspire your nearby troops. And they have a bonus against mount. Same thing. Well, they have good, like, decent charge stats. They, again, aren't going to do... You're not going to see the damage that, say, like, Lancers would do. Like, the Lorian Lancers, they're going to get way more kills than these guys would in melee. Any other cavalry unit that has the standard like rank and file formation is going to be better on the charge than these guys but still you do at least get some cavalry but matching the archer theme they are both cavalry archers so we will now fight our pretty much standard enemy here i have brought dorgolder to battle since there are no more factions to fight and we'll see as the archers all basically are in range at the start silver thorn arrows coming in and this is what i mean the high arc of fire means they aren't likely to get many body piercing shots, but if you can get them close range, they will do a ton of damage. Now, we'll try to see if I can uh, take these trolls out before they get into melee. Now, let's check the troll stats before it gets to like 38 30. So they're close to the ends, but not quite as good there. I'm going to have all of my archers try to shoot these trolls, please. To, oh, Hini Dower, let's, let's have you not get that close to the trolls. Hini Dower also do great against trolls, even though they can fire through a few of their models at one time. But what I really want to do, I want to get the Hini Dower on the flanks and firing into all those heavily armored Merkwood Uruks. But I don't want them to get hit by those trolls. But look as they all just start going down in mass. Send some woodland warriors into melee now. Most of the trolls are dead. They might get into melee here. Elder Council about to throw some javelins. Four trolls remain. Here come the javelins. And there goes the last of the trolls. Throw these guys out a bit more. Now, Hini Tower, let's go ahead and hit those Merkwood Uruks. Show the damage that we can do with these guys. Within Warriors fighting Goblin Stalkers, an okay trade for them there. We're going to send the Mytheri the Wire into melee now. Here come the body piercing shots. And as you can see, or well, they're not firing at the moment. As these shots come in and they arc to slow it down, see that they hit multiple units at one time. 
this is still a relatively high firing arc but for maximum optimization you would want to get them a little bit closer you'll see the bloodline streaking as they pierce through many of these Merkwood Uruks I'm gonna get them a little closer here then the cavalry to charge into these Merkwood Goblins just clear them out a little bit earlier like they're already routing this is great Oh, Elven King's Axe Guard gonna have to take a charge from the Shadow Knights. That's okay, they take a little bit of damage, but we do have the Elven King's Gate Guard. who are in close range, then charge into the Shadow Knights. Come on, guys. Get in the melee there, please charge. That was awful, that was an awful charge. Well, I had them tried, didn't I? Oh, any that are getting caught in the melee, that is my fault. Let's not have them do that, please. They're getting the gate card in on the Shadow Knights now, and they should start dying in masses. That 17 attack with bonus versus cavalry just cuts them down. And I think we've got a big line here, so I'm going to try to shoot straight through this blob at close range, and we'll see the damage that these guys truly can do. We're going to start firing, and watch as the devastation ensues. This is much better with the arrows fire more or less straight into the formation. They're going to get just tons and tons of kills. Now, these guys do have decently higher armor stats. But if there is a big blob like what's happening over here, I might try to get them a little bit closer. Try to reinforce our front line. Shoot those Castellans. Come on, lads, get in the melee. Charge into those Shadow Guard. Shadow Guard decent in melee, but our Elder Council will hold the line. Shoot into these Merkwood Goblins right down the formation. Let's see what kind of damage we can do. Like we should shoot the units directly in front so they just fire 90 degrees. Here they go. Archer shots coming inbound. Low power shots, but still absolutely cleaving a swath through the enemy with those arrows. Up here come the Shadow Knights. I should probably focus those down. In fact, there we go. Look at that damage coming in on the Shadow Knights. This is the damage. You can see there are just tons and tons of bodies already here. Let's get away from the Castellans. Where are the Arid here? Come on, let's get the Hinny Dower out of there. I'm not showing a good display here. Oh, and I want to just see the Arid here get thousands of kills in this battle. Merkwood Goblins fighting our Axe Guard here. That's fine. That's more of a waste than anything. Let's try to get them into a better position. I think we're fighting a couple of Shadow Knights here. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I really don't mind. Eric here, why don't we shoot the Shadow Guard while the Hinidar try to escape around the other side. Ethericon, help out the horse archers in melee. Try to swing the uh the Arid here or the Hinidar right over here and fire into this blob. Reinforcing our front line. The Woodland Warriors have fallen, but the Ents are still fighting. A few have died in melee combat here against the Merkwood Uruks. Maybe a few javelins got at them. But even the Ents are not invincible. Eric here, let's get you in melee. Let us take out the Castellans, please. we to get a little bit closer here. Let's try to fire at this range and see what kind of damage we can do. I think we've beaten out the enemy Shadow Knight, which is good. And now start shooting at the Shadow Guard. And come on, lads, why aren't you firing? Come on, please fire. Maybe we just, maybe we just need to move them a little bit. Alright, let's send the archers here into melee. Check the woodland scouts. There's a few body piercing shots right into the flanks of the Castellans. And look at that damage. They're all getting recoiled from those shots. 97 units it started with and down to... So we got about 20 of them there. Now, Castellans are no slouches. 27 defense, 17 armor. And these guys are not body piercing, but still 48 shots going into a unit of this caliber. That body piercing means they do tons of damage per shot, more so than any other archer would do. And the Castellans are just not having a good time here as they get side shot to death here. And that is the power of the Hinny Dower. Again, if you're shooting something like Berkwood Goblins or very low armor units, then every arrow is basically guaranteed to kill those. When you get into these higher armored units, it's a little bit less likely to get a kill, but still. Oh, the Shadow Guard. Hey, 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 watch out, watch out. All right, let's, let's... Let's help out against the Shadow Guard, please. I don't want the Hinny Dower in melee with those units. They will actually beat the Shadow Guard. Fighting some Merkwood Uruks here. 
Try to get some... There goes their general. This is great. The rest of the orcs may begin to flee soon. I think there's still some goblins in here. Some weaker units. Dorgaldur host. The Ents are down to seven. They've been fighting host for a very long time. Not the best unit for the Ents to fight. Do a few close range shots here right into the Merkut Uruks as they begin to rout. Come on, lads. Please shoot. Please shoot. What are you doing? There we go. Right into the backs, and they're going to start fleeing and dying in droves. Look at that damage. The blood splatters everywhere. We've more or less won the battle at this point. I think I just need to clear out the Castellans. The Castellans are... They are relentless. They will fight to the bitter end here, so they are the last unit that we do need to take out. Where's our armor-piercing units? Axe Guard are on the other flanks. We'll send the Axe Guard in. Eric here, where are you guys? I'm looking for them. They are in melee with the Castellans, so they shouldn't have too much of an issue then with them in melee. Come on, use, that arm, use those armor-piercing axes. Get the Axe Guard a little bit closer. Move the Henny Dower over there. Maybe just have them fire at will. Come on, play those last few Castellans. Here come the Axe Guard. The Gate Guard, they're at 46. They lost half their battalion, but they were holding off. I mean, look at all the Goblin bodies that are out here that are annoyingly being hidden by the grass as I zoom in. But if you zoom out, you can see there are just bodies absolutely everywhere. And there's only, okay, there's only three... Castellans left. That one just got executed. The X Guard were a bit late, and there goes the last of them. And we'll see how many kills they managed to get here. The Hini Dower got 500 kills in this battle, and that is that is less than usual. You could easily get thousands of kills with that unit on other battlefields. Let's check the rest of the stats. 69 by the Bodyguard, 145 by the My Theory Three Wire. They did excellent. The X Guard and the Gate Guard getting about 200 kills there. Eric here is getting 200 kills. The Atherikon getting 350 there. They were just fighting goblins. And even the Ents, 251 kills fighting the more defensive Murkwood Uruks and the Dorgolder host. Great, great effects in battle from them. So that is it for the faction overviews. And I will be starting a campaign shortly on the channel. Hale is, at the time, their scripts have not been implemented, but the roster has been, so I'm... Um, I'm a little bit on the fence on Dale at the moment. I'd like to wait for some script development, but I also kind of want to show off the new changes, but I do need to get that cleared up. So there will be a new campaign soon. Um, I want it to be Dale, but I will need to check some things out with the team first before any of that can be revealed. So I'll make some community updates um, as time goes by along the following week as I find out more information. But until then, my friends, farewell.